your hand and try to stop you from being left handed. That's exactly what happened to my brother. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, like I, they tried to do that to me. And I was like, I kept fighting them. Because I'm like, like, they would do it and I'll pick it back up. Right? <laughs> and same thing with the art. Art? You talking about art? Well, you better get a good government job and shut up and put this tie on and cut your hair, you know? And I think that my generation is like the last generation that went through that. Like, we, we rejected that. And that was the whole, whole thing. And so, with, the, with, with having said that, we have the opportunity to do something different. And um, so, in that sale, I, I kind of put these stories of three different men from three different generations who had a different outlook for that, those experiences. And I started as a poet. I uh, was never as good as Raquel. Uh, and Raquel has a poem that we was going to open with, but now we're going to close with. You know what I'm saying? So don't go nowhere. Uh, um, and so the first play was Prison Poetry because I was following Holly's directive. And so it was a small project, but fortunately uh, I needed that validation so it was successful. I won a literary award for that one. So I shudder, if that was not successful, I probably would have stopped. I probably would have quit. So I want everybody to know that you do not have to wait to be validated. You have to sign your own Emancipation Proclamation with your own pen. You are already good enough. And everybody has one story that the whole world needs to hear. Your yeah, talent is how many more stories you can come up with, but unfortunately the story that the world wants to hear is a story you don't want to talk about. The one you, want to, you don't want nobody to know about. And I, I'm blessed enough to be open enough to share these stories. And uh, so it started because Holly told me to write plays. <laughs> and so I started with that. And, and like I said, hearing the actors reading my words back was so therapeutic. And so I thought the next progression from that would have been film. So I, that's why I went after, after uh, the film. Uh, but I also went after the film because Jay-Z had a similar experience in Africa that I had. And when, um, Jay-Z, for those that don't know, he had a, a documentary called Water for Life. When, um, when um, Kofi Annan was Secretary General of the UN, Jay-Z spoke at the UN. And because Jay-Z had resources, he put up his own money to build uh, merry-go-rounds for kids to play on, but was actually self-powered wells to, to pump fresh groundwater. Save countless lives. No one talks about that. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, Jay got to, I got to get this film to Jay, maybe he make the movie. <laughs> and my brother, shout out my man Hubs in the house, Drabu's in the house, Where your hand, Drabu. Drabu is one of the actors um, that read for, um, uh, Nineveh was a screenplay, uh, right here on this stage many moons ago. Uh, and so my brother um, is a music uh, producer, so he knew one of Jay-Z people, uh, Beehive's cousin actually, and I, I got a meeting with him. And I took the screenplay and he looked at it and said, this is, it's, it's, it's all right, it's all right, but I don't see how we can make money with it. And I was like, am I dumb, but I'm sitting here trying to convince him, this guy runs uh, um, Rock Nation, how he gonna make money with a dude that got all the Chinatown bus to come see him in New York? How he gonna make money messing with me, right? What I should have said was that I thought Jay wanted to make history, not just make money. That should have been my you know, challenge. But I missed my point. But I'm so glad he said no. I was glad he took the meetings because it, it boosts boost my ego. But because he said no, I now have a project that's twice as better because that was a screenplay. You know how they say that you can't fit the whole book in the movie? Because the book is much more material. I have twice as much material. It's twice as strong, twice as better. Like, this is the story. That wasn't it. That was the beginning. This is the this is the finish. Uh, that was a long one. I'm gonna try to be short with my answer for one so we ain't on the radio show, so that's why I was talking. <laughs> this book in many ways defies a genre definition. However, like quite a few works I'm seeing by black writers and black um, screenwriters and black directors today, it includes a great deal of what would be considered either magical realism or science fiction. Why did you decide to take that approach? I prefer to call it Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism. Yes. Well, and for those who want to get a better understanding of Afrofuturism, there's a wonderful exhibit at the National Museum of African American History and Culture right now that's open this week and will be there until uh, four years. So please go and visit that. 
and take your kids, take your parents, because um, they can learn to. Uh, Afrofuturism is dope. Um, and um, I say that as my answer because Octavia Butler, we all know, is a science fiction writer. And shout out again to Siobhan because he had her here. And it, the room was packed. I couldn't get in. I should have snuck in. I was, so that was the last time I followed the rules. <laughs> that was really serious. The last time I followed the rules. Because I said, oh, I can't get in. I could have went right through this little back door right in the side right here and tested my relationship with this man. Was saying, like, I need to see this woman. But I didn't do it. I played nice, followed the rules, said, I'll see her next time. And she died the next year. That's right. It was her last appearance in public. It was her last appearance in public. So don't lean back. Y'all hear me? Don't lean back. Don't play nice. All right. So and don't play nice either. You know what I'm saying? Humble savage. Um, you can talk shit and smile. Um, so she said, so I, I, once I heard her name, um, when I, cause I had already written the screenplay and it's, it's people's reading like the actors and the artists, the artists like Octavia Butler. So I was hesitant to read anything from her cause I didn't want to be overly influenced in my work. But I studied her. I watched all her interviews. I studied her life, what she had to say, what was she thinking, blah, 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 blah. I studied the person. And she said, why is it fictitious for black people to imagine themselves in the future? So that left sci-fi a bad taste in my mouth. But she said her card, her card says writer. It doesn't say science fiction. But this is what the, the genre they put on us. All right? And but then I met um, Walter, um, Mosley a few weeks ago um, with, with Paul Coates, by the way, your boy Paul Coates. Yes. And um, he said that science fiction writers are the smartest writers because they work with tools that we don't have yet. And without science fiction writers, we won't have a future. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mm. So I'm somewhere in between, but I synthesize that to say Afrofuturism. So I hope that answers your question. And yes, I feel like, because you mentioned in the book, Octavia Butler, or in an interview you mentioned Octavia Butler, it's one of my favorites. I had the good fortune to interview her on Howard University Television some years ago, and I had been a fan of her work for a long time. But in this particular case, the society that you envisioned, the society that you created in this book, was a, was a dictatorship. And a dictatorship that was based on the availability or lack thereof of water. But it was clear that in looking at this dictatorship, you are also picturing the country in which we now sit and are living. Talk about how that came to you. Well, I'm so glad that uh, we got a chance to give you your, give you your, your flowers. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that we have a dead orchid plant on stage here tonight. And you might ask them, why would he put a dead orchid plant with a bow tied around it on stage? Because that is where we are. If I'm telling you that there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish in a few years, in our lifetime, if we don't do something different. If I'm telling you that uh, Flint, Michigan still has dirty water, Detroit, Michigan has exorbitant water um, um, bills right now to the point that a lot of people, because it's a poor city, can't afford it, so they, their water gets cut off. You know what happened when your water get cut off? Child Protection Services come take your kids. So we have water refugees in this country right now. Now what they're not mentioning is that Flint and Detroit are a short drive to the largest fresh body lake on the planet, the Great Lakes. How the hell can you be that close to the largest body of fresh water on the planet and still have a problem if there wasn't corruption, greed, crimes being committed, so forth and so on. Now on top of that, Nestle, the corporation, I think it's Swiss, you know them for chocolate, but his money maker is water. Everybody say water. Say, so if you can just walk out here changing your, the way you speak, you'll change a lot of the way people think. Because water is being taken advantage of. Water makes you want to know, what do you mean? Okay? So, Nestle pumps one million gallons of water out of the Great Lakes a day. You know how much they pay the state of Michigan for that? Or, you know, or at least on, on the books? $200 a year. $200 a year, okay? So how is it they pump water out of the lakes $200 a year 
and folks in Detroit can't afford their water bill. Folks in Flint, Michigan don't have water. So I'm saying you have a crisis right now, but we're not looking at it that way. So in my, in my story, the polar ice caps have melted, some cities have been submerged, some cities have, been, um, have emerged. That's not a make-believe. Dubai is a city they built out of the ocean. It's a landfill. It's an emerged city, okay? Go to Miami, enjoy uh, Art Basel, go to South Beach, take a lot of pictures, because it's gonna be underwater when um, 2050 get here and there's more plastic than fish in the sea. It's, this is not me talking, this is widely accepted facts. So that's why I hesitate to say this book is fiction or not. I think it's futuristic. I'm telling you a, a captivating story, an entertaining story for those who like to know about what could happen, what will happen, unless we do something. And our problem is that we have allowed the people who created the problems and we expect them to solve those problems. And uh, one of my other literary heroes is uh, Alice Walker, and she said the greatest power is convincing people they don't have any. So I want people to be convinced they have, have power, okay? I have very little resources, but somehow I've managed to produce uh, works that have been awarded, I've managed to build a station, I've managed to have a building that's paid for, in uh, Anacostia, the right beside of Monarchy Avenue, I've managed to sit here and have a wonderful relationship with one of my greatest uh, heroes in the media space. Um, so you can do something. You can't do something, but you have to work outside your comfort zone. But far too many of us want to stay within our comfort zone, and that is the problem. Mm. In this book, you mentioned several of my own literary heroes, one of them being Claude McKay. You quote from his poem, If We Must Die, Claude McKay being the Jamaican born poet that was a part of the Harlem Renaissance. But even though you quote him, in the poem, If We Must Die, and even though you're talking about a revolution against a dictatorship, this book never mentions race. Why not? Koza read the work, man. Koza read the work, man. Koza read the work. I'm sorry, I'm just blown up. Yeah, look, Angela Davis is reading this book. So y'all gotta understand I'm having a, a, a sweating apple moment. <laughs> 